John Lilly once put it this way, there are no limits at all to the human mind whatsoever except those we impose on ourselves because of our beliefs. And those limits are also beliefs to be transcended. And that's a view that suggests that the possibilities of human transformation are virtually infinite. That we have no way of knowing the outer horizon of what it means to be human. And really, to understand all this, everything, you have to go very, very deep in, into uh, a study of uh, history, consciousness, neurophysiology, everything. You have, to be, you have to be the supreme eclectic type of uh, leaning, and you really have to be wanting to know who you are and, and what everything is about. The thing that you'll find when you go to sacred sites, if you're very humble about it, is that you are on a personal journey and the sacred site will respond to you in a way that is appropriate only to you. The information is always what you are searching for. And it's the intent you give uh, that energy that defines whether it is used for right action or not. And it is inside these sacred spaces that you will be reminded that you are a god, that you are a bright star. So what you're trying to do is move through the course without ricocheting off walls or creating karma. You're trying to slide through things smoothly. How do you do that? It's called flowing. There is a technique that you can do that will allow you to touch some part of your inner being that has more knowledge than your conscious state does. Galileo, don't go to Florence. Why not? It's ruled by monks. There are scholars too. Lackeys. I'll take them by the scruff of the neck and make them look through my tube. Even monks can be seduced by proof. Galileo, you're setting out on the road to disaster. <laughs> you're suspicious and skeptical in science. But in politics, you're as naive as your daughter. How can those in power leave a man at large who tells the truth, even about the remotest stars? Can you see the Pope calmly writing down in his diary, 10th of January, 1610, heaven abolished? <laughs> <laughs> a while ago, when you were at your telescope, I saw you tied to the stake. And when you said you believed in proof, I smelled burning flesh. If they'll have me, I'll go. begin with an observation of the satellites of Jupiter, the Medicean stars. Sit down here, please. Thank you, my boy. No, I'm afraid it's not as simple as that. Before we use your celebrated instrument, Mr. Galilei, we beg the favor of a disputation. Subject, can these moons exist? A formal disputation? Why don't you just look through the telescope and see for yourselves? Here, please. Uh, yes, yes. You are aware that your proposition 
that there are stars revolving around some center other than the Earth, that there is nothing holding the universe up, is in contradiction to the wisdom of the ages. Yes. Apart from my mathematical friend's reservations as to whether these moons are possible, I, as a philosopher, ask you, are they necessary? <laughs> Aristotle, I, divine I, uh, Shall we speak in everyday language? My colleague, Mr. Ferrazzoni, doesn't understand Latin. Does that matter? Yes. The debate will be less brilliant, but it's your house. The cosmos of the divine Aristotle, with its crystal spheres and their mystical music, is an edifice of incomparable order and beauty. Why should we go out of our way to look for things which can only strike a discord in that ineffable harmony? Your Highness, would you care to observe these unnecessary and impossible stars through the telescope? Mr. Galilee, Nobody doubts that your brainchild, or shall we say your adopted brainchild, is brilliantly contrived, but one is tempted to observe that if your tube shows something that cannot exist, it must be a rather unreliable tube. How's that? With the utmost deference, Mr. Galilee, I suggest that what one sees in your eyeglass and what is in the heavens might be two entirely different things. Admirably put. Great restraint. They think we painted the Medicean stars on the lens. <laughs> Are you accusing me of fraud? Yeah, we wouldn't dream of it in the presence of His Highness. Is there something wrong with my stars? Your Highness's stars are fine. The gentlemen are only wondering whether they really exist. Can you see the claws on the great bear? Yes. And everything on the bull. Are you gentlemen going to look or not? Certainly. What's the matter with you? This stupid. Deplorable child. Your Highness, I have just received an important message. I think we should go at once. Gentlemen, the sum of our knowledge is pitiful. It has been my singular good fortune to get hold of a new instrument that brings a small patch of the universe a little bit closer. It's at your disposal. Make use of it. Your Highness, ladies and gentlemen, where is all this leading? Are we, as scholars, concerned with where the truth might lead us? Mr. Galilei, the truth might lead us anywhere. Your Highness, these nights, all over Italy, telescopes are being turned on the sky. The moons of Jupiter have never been seen before, and yet they exist. The man in the street may conclude that a good many other things may exist if only he opens his eyes. Gentlemen, we oughtn't to be defending shaky doctrines. You are teachers. You ought to be doing the shaking. I wish your man would keep out of what is supposed to be a scientific debate. Your Highness, it looks as if we have to go to the shipyards nowadays to find the high curiosity that was the glory of Greece. Well, I'm sure Mr. Galilei will find admirers in the shipyards. <laughs> Your Highness, I find this highly informative discussion has exceeded the time we allowed for it. It is imperative that we leave at once. What are my cakes, Your Highness? But you need only to look through the telescope his Highness will, of course, seek the opinion of the greatest living authority, Christopher Clavius, Astronomer-in-Chief at the Papal College in Rome.
Hey guys, welcome. It's Andre Hodge, Infinite Potential Healing, Servant of Truth, and Maximus Bradius in the house. Hope this finds you well. Um, as always, thank you for finding me. If you're new, all cool, welcome along the epic roller coaster ride of truth. From my perspective, anyway, it's up for you to discern. So I hope this finds you well. I hope I find you at an awesome state in your journey and existence on our freaking amazing planet. It's interesting times as always, so I'm not gonna talk too much. I'm gonna get into what I'm gonna get into. So what I'm wanting to do is expand the Amplify the Echoes of Our Souls Ancient Truth series. And um, this series for me is one of the most important ones. And when I started doing it just at the end of 2021, it was a very significant thing for myself. Unless you really have put yourself out there in this sort of way and and allowed the world that's very judgmental at this stage, looking for everything wrong and the right and all this sort of stuff, to actually have gone through all I've gone through and then to come across, say, Ashiana Dean's material and then offer it. I don't think you really get the level of polarity against her and her perspectives, right? And so, my rationale for doing that is, it was like, how the hell is this stuff not known? Why is the community and out there not across this stuff? Why is it pretty much, like it's been offered and stuff, but it's really not supported or used as a foundation. And if it was mentioned, it was quite fascinating. I mean, I used me as a variable. I, I question why I didn't hear it and stuff and many, many things. And I don't really, I'm not really aiming to get into me, but I'm a metaphor. One of the variables I, I think I do better than most is that I'm able to penetrate through the issues and blocks. I'm able to get through and observe myself why I can't do that, but I can also tune in and work on it and clear it. And I'm able to actually transmute it and flip it and see that, like in the, early on in the Echo series, I talked about the sympathetic resonance to the falsehood, where in my perspective, during the Babylon massacre, I think in part three and four, I'm going to use context for the earlier ones in this and I'll get to the topic in a sec and what I'm going to name about but what I'm just doing is setting it up and I feel one of the things I relish is actually blowing my own mind sort of thing so when I am unable to appreciate a variable such as say Ashiana it's not something I like I honor my body for not being in it. I ask myself, why is that so? And I'm able to invest the energy and sort of stuff. So this release is coming after I've just offered Emotional Mastery Part 6 and how your feelings state can influence or affect your perception mechanics, all right? So all of that I offered in that and I hope you really explored it and appreciate how significant that release is for your potential and your navigation and your discernment and your as I said navigation in what we've got to come I hope it really amplifies your potency and perception and getting a fair bit of wind we've got some weather coming on later so um I really invite you to contemplate and explore yourself and your body tech and your navigation and your discernment, especially from the feeling state sort of thing, because you can't assume that what you're feeling is accurate. And my purpose for offering that was inviting you all to see how easy it is actually to manipulate our feeling state and our body and then we're a bit of a passenger to it so it can really influence our navigation and stuff. So so what I 
what I've been brewing for a while in the background with many of my processes is I'm actually wanting to do a really massive Ayani Massacre release and I'm wanting to actually include the specific recording where Asher released it to the public and I, I feel very strongly that actually my purpose in offering some of the clips relative to it is you actually are able to tune into her specific frequency so I add it for more depth because her material is quite hard to find and all this sort of stuff. There's there's channels out there that are offering it and it's a bit more accessible. But going back to that late 2021 era, it was incredibly poetic. And obviously I offered, leading up to that, that a lot of work I did on myself to clear myself out and I went back to my roots sort of thing and cleared all the bullshit away. All right. And the result was truth, right? So, or my perspective of truth, and that's where I've I've embraced it and expanded on it, and then found Carlene, and we've done the GSF stuff late late 2022 up until February and stuff, and we've had a bit of a break, and um, since then had a massive sort of March 14th, 2023 someone else out there activated the grid to be encrypted in 12D you can take it as you want I'm offering it and I'm standing by that and it was a massive achievement and I'm gonna let it be known because it's context alright and I'm gonna I'm gonna just get onto that word context in a, in a moment because context is all context gives you the data set that allows you to have a better perception, appreciation of it and I might include a little clip that I it was interesting, I was watching a doco series and this forensic scientist used the word context so I might include a little clip of that here so yeah, context, I'll just show an image I drew quick to say say the way the narrative and stuff and I apologise for the wind, I'll have the image next to me and ideally it would be a lot better I'll just get through this because I don't want to spend too much time. Let's say, if we have all the data, right, assume that we have all the data, then we can make better decisions and navigate, right? This world, the way it's set up, it's designed, in my, from my perspective, just for a simple uh, level of appreciation, is that it's designed to not offer the context that so we actually consciously choose the wrong path and assume that what the narrative wants for us, we take on board. So say from the Babylon Massacre, which was 3470 BC, we're all white, so we have no, our DNA's all been reduced, all this sort of stuff, and then false memories are inserted and all the Akasha bullshit and all that sort of stuff has been implemented to make it practically impossible to understand and comprehend, which all this stuff just shows how powerful we are that they've needed to resort to all this shit, all right? So, that's just context, all right? When we have context, we understand the reason why things have happened and how they are. And the absence of context can influence our perception mechanics, all right? So I'm just gonna move on. So, I'm gonna call this Amplify the Echoes of Our Souls Ancient Truth, Part 11. Origin of Humanity, Anunnaki, and our epic lost history okay and I usually like to write a lot and stuff like that but YouTube have a hundred character limit on the title so I'm gonna fit something around that so what I'm brewing to do is set up for a really epic Ayani Massacre release because I've gained a lot more data on that just from myself and interaction with some pretty amazing clients that have been through a lot of shit but have all been part of it so so one aspect I do is I actually if you really appreciate what Carleen and I have offered and especially what she's tuned into about there was there was an epic ambush 420 billion years ago and we've been invaded not um it's not source that everything going on is related to it's an actual invasion that's compromised source and we've been polluted and cor corrupted 
from the universal level for a very long time, which went back about 560 to 70 billion years. And, and in this sort of recent era of galactic history stuff, uh, galactic special force stuff I've done with Carlene in particular, we've identified that 420 billion years ago there was a massive ambush where we actually had them cornered and set up for resolution and then they ambushed us and we've been on the run for 420 billion years. Okay, And so one big number that Asher puts out is the 250 billion year war in the Stargates that if you've listened to the Metatron sort of recordings on my Asher page where I've got all the downloads and I intend to add more to them, uh, a lot of the audios that I'll include in these sort of things I'll actually offer there at some stage. I've been aiming to do something along this theme with this sort of Asher content for quite a while and as I said, Recalibration Part 5, I went through a massive sort of upgrade integration of past lives and cleared out all the overlays and hacking and stuff to get myself to another level and I'm I'm giving the I'm giving the skin suit a bit more gas if you want with all the new stuff that I've got alright so so yeah what I'm brewing to do at some some point is actually offer a really massive expanded Ayani Massacre release. I've also got really cool Babylon Massacre content relative to what actually happened to our mechanics relative to that event. So I'll look to do something with that at some stage. And I've got other material as well and I've been brewing a lot and I, I actually want to expand on the recent release that Emotional Mastery Part 6 because I want to get it a bit more advanced because there was stuff there that I didn't include because I it was just significant and a very complex video to do with all the clips and stuff, especially with what I've been through recently. But it's also incredibly important that people really master their bodies and stuff to get that out there. All right. So so what I want to do in this is actually a bit different. Usually I offer clips around the content relative to Asher and sort of offer my own appreciation of what I've expanded on. A lot of the material that I used is very early on when she released it raw with not a lot of context around and it was a huge achievement as I said with Colleen to just get something out there that we can um, we can have as a reference. To say what Colleen and I have done, we've, expanded, we've, we've used that as a foundation and we've gone to work and expanded on it. So the big thing is the invasion and the corruption of Source and there's been no sort of reference of that and what I said about the CDT tablets that she refers to in my opinion there was a massive investment to actually hack them and the assumption that they couldn't get hacked is a vulnerability all right and if you're referring to that and it's been obfuscated then like that context drawing you don't have the context of it all right so we can be vulnerable and stuff and so the big thing over a long time is we think we have to restore source because this negative aspect of source is a part of us. So it's been like a trap. There's been rules that we've had that these invaders aren't applicable to and they've just dominated and, you know, we've had no... It's like a blitzkrieg sort of thing of falsehood that's come through from another universe that we've just had no, nothing... We've been handicapped by this assumption... Okay, I'll just get to that point. So what I'm going to do, as I said, Origin of Humanity and Inaki and our epic lost history. So I've got about an hour of Ash from some very, very cool content where she was actually in Hawaii, early 2002, where that's where she released the Ayani Massacre sort of stuff, right? So what I'm wanting to do... I want to basically offer it as a really awesome cellular memory download integration as a reference with her specific frequencies that you can hear and appreciate because she is epic. And what I intend to do is not interrupt it a lot, give you a lot. I think that overall there's about an hour or so and that will be pretty rich 
okay so there's going to be sort of this sort of material is going way back and offering the origins of how the origins of how humanity came about and then the sort of second section that I I'm going to add is the origins of the Anunnaki to set up for what's been going on on earth all right to then maybe do one or more releases like this to then brew you to really appreciating the significance of the INE &E massacre and what has gone on after that so all of the galactic special forces and releases I've sort of done I'll tell all, all expand that and give data and the recordings with Colleen as well but yeah like my my going back you know I've if you were across me you know my history it's not really that appreciated out there and I have to talk about it but say if you watch recalibration to a new energetic reality part five and my 10 years of say involvement with certain people and stuff going back to 2013 when Andrew released Galactic History 1 and to Mount Shasta and stuff so when you listen to this it'll give you the information relative to Mount Shasta as well what I said in that all right but the only real time that he talked about the Anunnaki is and and those of you that have been thorough and very um, invested in that sort of stream of information how much how do you think that was ever talked about the Anunnaki all right it was just sort of passing comments not much offered all right and in Galactic History 1 I know it was in part 2 about halfway through he basically said that light and dark were battling for so long over here the multi-dimensionals which only went up to 7D oh sorry the multi-Ds that only went up they were like 6th, 7th, 8th and ninth dimensional beings when in actual fact the negatives go up to 11 and a half and particularly Thoth alright and the Anunnaki alright so there was a ceiling of like clear territory that if if we're we've we've been offered that the absolute limit of the negative is 11 10 and we don't consider it goes higher then we've been sort of left a big vulnerability of frackery i'll just get to that point and so in galactic history one part two about halfway through he says that basically there was all this tech and Light and dark had battled each other and fought it, each other out and exhausted, so we had no resources, sort of, so to speak. So the Anunnaki were lured here with all the tech here, and they were victims and they were trapped. Essentially, that's what he said, all right? So I really want you to... You go do your discernment with that. I mean, I just remember it, because I'm... I'm just... I've, memory is one of my skills, and if you've explored my vitamin k2 d3 video i understand the mechanics of the body because our skeletal body is our data repository that our brain processes and that so i've always had a good memory but i i appreciate that i know the mechanics of the body and trusted it invested into those foundational nutritional sort of aspects to help with it right so and and my attitude about memory is like if i'm going to put the effort into learning this what is the point of forgetting like to me, um, you have to understand the IT geek in me. It's like laziness is a variable, right? So why would I want to repeat the effort that takes so much to find all this stuff? It's just so, it's like gold, you know? Why would you lose the wisdom that you gain and stuff? And so I'm very good at, and I did um, some memory mechanics. I think it was about 10 or 11 into the multi-dimensional method to the 3D madness where I talk about this you trust the body it's there and it will and you go passive and the, the information will come when it's required you know it's a very subtle trusting the tech and how it works and then um, you'll know when you need to know what you need to know you don't have to go in and search the files of your data and just find it you can trust the tech and it will work and you'll just know So my purpose of offering, say if I do more than this, to set up for that context of the irony is to invest that potential in you and not even knowing it, 
like that. So what I'm going to do with this sort of intro, I'm going to invite you to really enjoy some very rich content from Asha that probably hasn't seen the light of day for many people for 20 years that I just like as I said earlier about the appreciation of her content if I push so hard as her and risk so much and then it wasn't her I would be hoping that someone like me would be like a champion of the truth you know to be able to make it accessible and contemplate and I've been very fortunate to deal with some people that have actually been involved in that era and stuff and it's bittersweet and I say that because I feel like and maybe you guys do as well you missed out but I also know that uh, from a purity of the information perspective, a lot of people might think that I'm naive and all this sort of stuff, but I'm actually not polarized or have any baggage associated with it. And my purpose to offer all this this era of content is knowing how few actually are across it. We get the opportunity to start from the basics and build upon that. And so context is all at the moment, right? So I hope you find this very rich you appreciate her just take away the the linguistics and the words and the concepts that stand out and as I said the origin of humanity Anunnaki right from her perspective the purpose like the creation of the Anunnaki was to go after the humanity in the universe all right because the humanity tech body skin suit was literally the defenders of the planets and the stargates and so the negative invasion forces that she uses the convoluted DNA sort of thing, their purpose from the get-go was to take us out. And by the naivety relative to the invasion, there was a huge vulnerability from the get-go. So what I'll do, and I'm not going to interrupt the flow too much, but I'll just add a little perspective relative to what I've learnt through what I've done and what we I know you say with Carlene to expand this and that's my perspective if if you don't agree with it that's cool but I I w won't interrupt it too much but I will aim to do that to make it a bit richer and to build upon what we've actually done in the field all right so thank you for being here guys and I'll impart that setup for you and I really hope you know that first time you hear some perspectives and it's so rich and powerful it's just my my joy in this life is discovery and i hope you get a lot of joy from the discovery of this perspective that has been lost for 20 years all right so i'll see you through it enjoy But what we're going to do in this workshop is we're going to start with the history that goes with this. Because the people that were drawn to this trip, and they're, all of the, the Shields clinics tend to work this way, the people who show up and who decide they want to come are the people who have been on that site before when major things have happened. It's worked that way in Peru, and it's worked that way in Florida. So the people here have been here before. Somewhere in your bodies you have a memory about that. And it may be happy memories because there are many, many eons that this place, now called Kauai, was a beautiful Garden of Eden type place. It was the place where the High Council security team, Stargate security team, always lived in concentration. This is the place where it was called the Mother Empire, where the Mother Empire, okay? It was not called Lumeria. It was called Maravi, and that's M-U-A-R-I-V-H-I. And the predominant race here were called the Mua, and the, they were the Maravavians, and it's hard to pronounce it, so they just called themselves the Mua. 
the Mu'a are a race that we're going to get into understanding where the Mu'a fit and where they came from and where the Lumerians, what they have to do with them in the material we got today for the workshop, which starts on page 55. To understand who the Mu'a are and their other contemporary races, we need to understand simply what the third seeding of the history of the human lineage was when it happened, who was seated here, and why. To understand why it's the third seeding, I gave you a brief capsulization on, there's also the maps in here. I'm going to go to page 60. Page 60 has a list of events, basic events. The events aren't described here, so I'm going to talk about them a bit. These are the events that have progressively led up to a period in time in which what's on the next page took place. It's called the Atlantean Conspiracy. The Atlantean Conspiracy led up to our particular time frame right now. So this is the timeline of events that have manifested into the world that we know now. And that began, really, 250 million years ago when the angelic human race from Tara in density 2, which is the counterpart of Earth, but in density 2, was seated on Earth, on parallel Earth, actually. 250 million years ago, angelic humans were seated on parallel Earth. They were seated there to, on a mission. It was called the Planetary Christos Realignment Mission. This was before the Nibiru and Diatic Crystal Grid was put in. There was damage to Earth's shields, the scalar templates that Earth manifests on, that had taken place in uh, 550 million years ago when the planet Tara was nearly imploded. Part of it was blown off and was sent into density two, I mean density one, from density two. It, it w came down in 12 parts. That is where our solar system came from. It, it's as old as our scientists think it is, but it wasn't in this harmonic octave when it started out. The whole thing came down when certain cataclysmic events took place on Terra that ripped apart, it ripped this system out of the Terran orbital system. And because of that, this place and all of the planets in it were headed for uh, becoming a large black hole at some point in time. It became what's called a phantom system. A phantom planet or a phantom system is a system that's cut off the grids which means the electromagnetic Merkaba fields are no longer plugged in to the universal Merkaba fields that come down and feed the Kundare, Kirishe, and Maharada current continually into the time matrix. So they become finite rather than having the potential of being infinite. When, it, when a, a person, a planet, or a planetary system, or a galaxy has its Merkaba field alignments where they're supposed to be, there are connections that go up the 15 dimensions, and connect into the primal sound fields which connect into source. There's a perpetual supply of energy, flux. Energy comes in and goes out. It circulates. It's a circulatory system. It is an eternal and perpetual circulatory system. Planets, people, or galaxies, or even universes, or even whole time matrices can become finite in nature if those Merkaba alignments are broken down to a point where the primal um, life force currents cannot circulate through them anymore. What happens in that case is the person, the planet, or the galaxy ends up with X amount of energy, what it had brought in to the point where it was severed from the grid. Once it expends that energy through the process of oscillation and vibration going up in oscillation, which is expending energy. Now this is how planets and people evolve. There are cycles that control the body rhythms, there are cycles that control, control time cycle rhythms in a planetary body. Times when the planet or the person will raise in frequency, which is raising an oscillation rate, become more electrical and transmit more energy, and then cycle back where that slows down, just like we, slow, we speed up the speed of the Merkaba to bring in more energy and then we slow it down and it, we bring it to a stop. Well, this is the process of how energy is processed for evolution in the time systems. When a person or a planet's Merkaba is severed from the planetary, the uh, harmonic time cycles, which run down the 15 dimensional scale, its time rhythms all get thrown off as well. It becomes finite and like, like a self contained little universe unto itself that will continue the process of raising in frequency and lowering frequency, but it doesn't have the ability to bring in any more 
of that frequency to charge the Merkaba fields anymore. So it will use the energy that's been in the Merkaba fields and progressively its high vibration becomes lower and lower and lower and it gets to a point where its polarity fully reverses on the subatomic level and particle and antiparticle fuse and the place implodes and it becomes a black hole. That's what the planet was headed for. Now humans were created, not here, they were created on Terra for the purpose of serving on Terra as the universal security team for the Terran stargates, but also for the universal stargates in this time matrix. Humans were created as part of a family that began as the Elohi Elohim. These are not the same as the regular ones calling themselves Elohim out there because they are Anu Elohim, the creators of the Anunnaki. The Anunnaki races were created by the Anu Elohim for the purpose of destroying the human races that were created by the Elohi Elohim. Now, the story of our creation goes back very, very far because to really understand who we are and why we're here, we need to realize this time matrix had its last life wave come in, which was a wave of consciousness to seed new life into the time matrix was 950 billion years ago. That's a very long time in our time term. Now, time is all simultaneous, right? That means there's a space in our universe, in our time matrix out there, that is that origin point that still exists and is going on. Now, from that point, while we're in linear time, there are a, se a series or a sequence of events that have taken place or appear to have taken place in linear fashion that connect us directly to that creation point when life was seeded in here. In the probability that we're in, the reality system that we're in, out of the many different ones that could be or, and that are, because of the way vibration and consciousness worked, there is a progression of events that if we go backwards through our history from here, way back up to that creation point, there's a series of events that if you trace it back forward, leads us to what happened here and what we're in the middle of today. That creation point that started 950 billion years ago went just fine for quite a while until about 250 billion years ago when something called the Lyran Elohim Wars broke out. There were a group of the Elohi Elohim that suffered something called code convolution. Code convolution is about the DNA templates and it's about the manifestation template. It's kind of like inbreeding. If you take a family and they keep having children just among their gene code, you start to get strange genetic distortions that weren't part of the plan and that nobody else had before. There was code convolution suffered by certain groups of the Elohi Elohim, and it gave them distortions in their DNA templates and in their consciousness. Because if your DNA template is distorted and it is not running in the natural flow of the dimensional structure, there are going to be blockages of consciousness flow, and you're not going to be able to embody the level of dimensional consciousness that you were created to embody. Hey, I hope you've enjoyed it so far. And as I said, I have a different perspective relative to the convoluted DNA sort of corruption that Asher gets into. And her perspective is that our DNA and these very advanced species over time, they devolved via inbreeding and stuff like that. What I will just interject is, and that's, she she's referring to the 250 billion year war that happened with the Stargates and, and that's where I said at the start that from Carlene and my perspective and Carlene has the ability to see and it makes perfect sense that there was an actual invasion and the invasion was obfuscated it was a massive investment to hide that context all right, from any understanding all right? and so if you don't have the context and the, the full spectrum of data relative to an event then the potential for misinterpretation is high and it's no discredit to Asher or anything like that I would just offer you that as a perspective to expand upon it now and take it on board and it's no negative to her at all as I said got enormous respect for what she's offered and stuff and doing this for that so what I'll do is I'll let you get back to it and appreciate the awesome perspectives of her more.
and we'll see you in a bit. All right, enjoy. There is a progression of events that if we go backwards through our history from here, way back up to that creation point, there is a series of events that if you trace it back forward, leads us to what happened here and what we're in the middle of today. That creation point that started 950 billion years ago went just fine for quite a while until about 250 billion years ago when something called the Lyran Elohim Wars broke out. There were a group of the Elohi Elohim that suffered something called code convolution. Code convolution is about the DNA templates and it's about the manifestation template. It's kind of like inbreeding. If you take a family and they keep having children just among their gene code, you start to get strange genetic distortions that weren't part of the plan and that nobody else had before. There was code convolution suffered by certain groups of the Elohi Elohim and it gave them distortions in their DNA templates and in their consciousness. Because if your DNA template is distorted and it is not running in the natural flow of the dimensional structure, there are going to be blockages of consciousness flow and you're not going to be able to embody the level of dimensional consciousness that you were created to embody. The Elohi, Helo Elohi Elohim that became the Anu Elohim were a group from a planet called Avion that was the Gate 11 planet, the Universal Stargate 11 planet. So, the Anu Elohim, before they were Anunnaki, before they were humans, there were Elohi Elohim, there were a group of them that fell, or their codes crashed because of code convolution, and they decided to sever their connection to Source. They decided they would be the creator gods in this time matrix, and they decided they were going to take over this time matrix. There were other races in this universe at that point. At the same time of creation, three primary races came in. You had Eloi Elohim, which were the Emerald Order. They were the blue flame carriers that carry, carried the frequencies of the Akkadic Ray, which was the one closest to Source. It's also the D13 primal light field. You had the Braharama, which carried the violet ray. And you had the Seraphi, Seraphim, that carried the gold ray frequencies. Now these frequencies were in their DNA templates that was their tribal shields. They were the three founding race matrices that came in to density five, dimensions 13, 14, and 15, to seed life into the time matrix. Everything in this time matrix came out of one of those three. Okay? Humans came out of the Elohi Elohim. The fallen Anu Elohim came out of the Elohi Elohim but they were a, a fallen race that lost its ability. It became a phantom race, just like a phantom planet. Because their DNA templates were convoluted, they couldn't run the natural Kira, Shea, and Kundere and natural consciousness of energy of Source anymore. And when that happens to a being, there tends to be distortion and polarity that happens in the thinking. And there have been problems with the Anu Elohim for literally 250 billion years before humans were ever created. There was another group out of the, the Seraphi races, the Gold Ray races, called the, uh, they, they became known as the Seraphim. So Seraphi are the ones that retained their gold coating, and the Seraphim are the ones that ended up with reverse coating, just like the Anu Elohim. <coughs> Excuse me. So the Seraphim fell, and the Anu Elohim fell from grace, if you want to say. They fell from the ability to be able to run the primal life force currents and to embody the D12 Christos frequency that would allow non-polarity of consciousness to exist in embodiment. So they went into extreme polarities of consciousness and they ended up playing the negative polarity, what we would consider the negative polarity. They went for, they took the anti-stance to what the Christos frequency represented. represented. That's what, where the concept of anti-Christos or anti, anti-Christ comes from. They're the races that took an anti-stance to the Christos principle of love and unity and perpetual life. They took this stance because of sickness. It is a sickness that a, that a being falls into where they no longer remember their connection to Source or why that is so valuable, where it will lead them to the point where they feel they have the right to exploit and cause harm to other races at their whim. And this is what happened with both the fallen Seraphim and the fallen Anu Elohim. 
And it was kind of interesting the way the drama unfolded during the Lyr and Elohim Wars 250 billion years ago. You had basically three stargates. They're the highest stargates in this time matrix. You have Stargate 12, Stargate 11, and Stargate 10. They are the main stargates in this time matrix because they connect all the lower dimensional fields to through the Christos fields, they are the Christos gates, into the primal light fields and out of this time matrix to the primal sound fields. They are the gates of final ascension out of the time matrix where consciousness goes back to its full at one moment with source. So they are the most valuable and most protected gates. Originally, before the problems happened with the Anu Elohim and the Seraphim, they had been part of the teams that were assigned as guardians of those gates, or keepers of the gates. They simply were the beings who lived in the places where the gates were and maintained them. If there was anything that needed to be done, they would do it. They maintained the gates. The Eloi Elohim are the cat people. They are the ones, their form, their Christos level form, when they first started to come into form, are large white cat hominids. So they look like cats, some of them more so than others. Some of them are literally furred, and they look like big white Persian cats. <laughs> and then some people call them the Leonines. There are a few channels that are actually talking to some of them that are directly part of their family that are from England. I remember somebody showed me a book years ago, and they said, do you know who these guys are? And I said, I think so, but I'm not sure. <laughs> you know, Because usually our guys won't do direct channeling, but it was a specialized group. So when we get into who were the founders, the easiest thing that to, your mind might go to is, Oh, well, they looked like us, too. Well, not exactly. The founders of all the races in this time matrix, none of them were human-shaped. All right? They, you had the Elohai Elohim cat people. They were cat hominid. You had the Seraphi Seraphim, who came in several shapes. One, well, actually, before they were Seraphim, before they fell. They were avian bird people. They were avian hominid where they would be feathered, upright, walking, bipedal people that looked like birds. They, the uh, Seraphi Matrix did the birds, the insects, and the reptiles, the good ones. They were fine when they were first created. Reptiles weren't bad things. They weren't a negative agenda force at all. But those type of life forms came out of the Seraphi Matrix. And part of the Raharama matrix, the violet ray matrix, created a lot of the cetaceans. They created like whale shapes and some of the dolphin shapes and those type of things. They also created a race called the pegasi, which were the our concept of horses with wings. They were like winged horses. Now these are in density four, which is their first coming into form is literally liquid light. When they come into density three, they become etheric matter density. When they come into density two, they become semi-etheric. And then at times, some of them have literally been manifest in physical form uh, in density one systems. So these were the originators of the life force in this matrix. What happened where we got the Draconians and the Anunnaki were out of the fallen Seraphim matrix. We ended up with a group of Draconians, which are different than reptiles. Draconians are more dragon-like. They're called the Omicron matrix. And they have one particular agenda. They're one group of the fallen seraphim. You have the reptile ones that are actual rep, actually reptile avian, which they're like um, bird reptile. Rather, they're like winged reptile things, not big and bulky like dragons and dinosaurs, but like the thin reptile kind of things. They're connected to snakes and those kind of things. Some snakes are out of their matrix, not all of them. Now, they became what's called the Odetochron matrix. Odetochron. Odetochron. The Omicron Draconian and the Odetochron Reptilian matrices have certain alliances. They moved from their original assignments, which I'll talk about in a minute, back to those three stargates. They moved into the Orion star system in an attempt to take over one of the main gates that you can get control over the top gates if you get control of enough of gate eight. Gate eight in the universal Templar complex, in the universal stargate eight, is located in the Orion star system at density three in Mintaka Orion. That's one of the planets in Orion, or one of the stars from our perspective. So from this area of Orion, you are, this is where we are getting our contemporary draconian reptilian invasive forces. Now, the Elohai Elohim that fell to become the Anu Elohim, they were originally from gate 11, 
and that was a planet in a, a density four planet, a liquid light planet, that was called Avion. They moved into various systems when they lost their commission on Avion, because once they fell, you, they couldn't be trusted. They were trying to use their stargates to take over the time matrix. They moved into the Arcturus star system and the Andromeda systems and into the Cirrus systems. All right. Why they moved to certain locations was because they were after certain gates. It was always, from the beginning, for the fallen angelic races, a quest for the stargates, because who controlled the universal Templar literally had a whole time matrix at their disposal, and they could be finite and feed off that time matrix and keep themselves eternal artificially, and they could do whatever they wanted without having to cooperate with the rest of creation. This was their motivation, and it's a motivation that only someone very sick would come up with, because you realize by doing that, you're only hanging yourself as well. You know, it would eventually lead to fine. You can, you know, take the time matrix and destroy everything in it, but eventually you're going to go with it. You know, you're, you're not going, you're going to trap yourselves. They, they don't even understand it. They, it's not reality to them. Dominion is more important. Now, in the Lear and Elohim Wars 250 billion years ago, we had the three stargates under the protection of the three different groups. You had the Elohi Elohim at Stargate 12. They were the High Council and they were the guardians of Gate 12, the one that leads directly into the Kiwishe light fields. They were the, the cat people and they were in charge of Gate 12. You had on Gate 11 the a, ver, a part of the Elohi Elohim and a part of the Braharama Violet Ray people. These were a group that were dolphin-like. The, the cetacean groups out of the um, Violet the, the, the violet ray people. So on gate 11, on Avion, you had what became the fallen Elohi Elohim, and you had the dolphin people. Then on gate 10, gate 10 is located at D10, dimension 10, in Vega, what we call, you know, the, the star system, the Vega star. That's still there. Now what happened with the other two gates above is what the Lyra and Elohim wars were about. It was kind of interesting because how the Anu Elohim ended up fallen and decided to tell the rest of creation, forget it, we're going to do it our way, was they were watching certain groups of the Seraphi races that were stationed on gate 10. They were watching them and becoming concerned because they had code convolution and they were afraid they were going to break the Emerald Covenant, which was the peace treaty that the three founders races had made that they would create a certain type of time matrix built on peace and love and harmony. Now, you have the ones on gate 11, the Elohi Elohim on gate 11 saying, we have to get rid of the ones on gate 10 because they're code convoluted and they're going to destroy things. And before they do, we want you guys, gate 12 guys, to come in and destroy them. That, that was against the Emerald Covenant to even make that request. You don't destroy them. You try to rehab people if they're having a problem. You don't just go in and blow them off the face of a planet. Because High Council would not use their power to destroy the, ser the, fault, the seraphim races that were going into code convolution, the Elohi Elohim on Avion, on Gate 11, that were also going into code convolution, it was like the pot calling the kettle black, decided that they were going to get rid of us, and then they would get rid of them. So they used the power of their Stargate 11. There's a way to back run the power when, the gate, when Stargate 12 begins to transmit its frequency down to Gate 11, down to Gate 10. If you reverse the fire letter sequences or the electrical programming on gate 11, when gate 12 begins to transmit, it throws the gate 12 energy back up into gate 12 and blows it up. They did that to this time matrix. And when that's when they became the fallen Anu Elohim. They took a stand against the rest of the higher fields of consciousness and against source. They tried to, in doing that, what they did was literally cut this whole time matrix off from the ability to run the Kirishe or the Kundere primal life force currents. They made the time matrix finite by blowing up gate 12. Because if you take off that gate 12, there's nothing for those higher currents to step down through to get down into the rest of the universe. It took many, many millions of years before the Elohi Elohim and the high councils from density 5 were able to restore that gate. But in the meantime, the, their wars broke out between the fallen Anu Elohim from Gate 11, which they, that, had, that had blown up Gate 12, and the Vega Fallen Seraphim. The Vega Fallen Seraphim figured, well, uh-oh, now we're in trouble because these guys hate us, and 
they decided they would blow up gate 11 to get rid of them. Just, so they would take control from gate 10. So literally, gates 11 and 12 in this time matrix were literally blown out. And that's, it's a big thing to blow out a universal stargate. That's not just a planetary stargate. That is a major feed. And these are the top ones, the ones that literally connect non-manifestation to manifestation. They sealed the whole life matrix in this time matrix when they did that, both of them. And they each went on their own way doing their competing forces because the ones that survived from each side were arch enemies. They were going to destroy each other and both had one agenda that was the same agenda. They wanted to destroy anything but their own in the time matrix and then simply use their own life force because they could seed things into the lower dimensions. They could create life forms just like we're, our scientists are learning to create life forms. It won't be too long before they know how to genetically engineer a human being simply from substance without even parents participating. You know, and this is what these beings that were fallen angelics, they appointed themselves as creator gods and they attempted to literally take over the whole life field here. That wasn't going to be allowed because if that's allowed to happen to a time matrix, it eventually becomes not only a black hole where a planet was, but a black hole where a whole time matrix was, which sucks in everything around it. So it would affect the other time matrices that were working well. And eventually it could cause major problems for source because so much of the energy would be blocked and unable to move. So it's simply not something that's allowed to happen. If it happens, it, there's always a repair team sent in literally from source down through the primal light, uh, sound fields and into the primal light fields to restore it because it has to be restored. So 250 billion years ago when the Lyran Elohim Wars ended up with knocking out Stargates 11 and 12, there was a major restoration campaign that was launched in this time matrix. It was run by the three founder races and the one put in charge of like the final, it's not really, it, I, I like to say that they, they were all on the same level, but it's not exactly true. There were the highest council, but it wasn't a subservience thing like it is here. It was a cooperation thing. There were one group of them that agreed to run the blue frequency, the blue ray, which is the one that requires the most coding to run. So they were the ones that were given the most responsibility and they also had the final say because of that. They could access the most information directly from source and the most frequency. They were the Ilaha Elohim. And then there was also the Braharama races that were the violet ray. They agreed to stay and assist and so did the Seraphi races. So the three founders races stayed in density five in this time matrix. Their consciousness collective stayed here and are committed to staying here until everything is restored back to its Christos template, which is its natural D12 template that allows for the, the natural way of life, which is coming into manifestation when you want to and being able to ascend out of it when you want to. That's what it was supposed to be. It was supposed to be fun to be here. It was supposed to be fun. What? Yeah, except because there is a very close affiliation between the Anunnaki and certain of the Violet Flame groups, there's a whole reverse Violet Flame movement being run through the Anunnaki matrix. So you have to be really careful with that. Yeah. All, yeah. That is a major trouble spot because when the Anunnaki recently turned and you know said forget the Emerald Covenant, they were going to go for Dominion. They took over that the gates in Shasta. What about that's Telos? Telos, yeah. There's actually wars happening in Inner Earth because of, because of all this. There are territorial boundaries. Anyway, I want to get back to the time frame where we are because I want to bring you up through the two lists that are here because this will bring us up to why we're here and the fact that we've been here before. And if we start to understand that, we'll start to open up parts of ourselves to ourselves. So anyway, when the gates were destroyed 250 billion years ago and the three founders races were committed to making sure that that mess got cleaned up because they took responsibility for it. They knew that the Anu Elohim and that the fallen Seraphim, they were their children. They were children that got messed up and they did some really horrid things. They never stopped loving them. That's why we'll teach to stand, you, know, you, you don't let a, neg you know, a negative agenda person or a negative agenda race come in and flatten you. That's just stupidity. But we teach that you love them as well and realize that if they remembered their I am presence, if they felt that alive within them, they would realize that they too are God. They don't have to play pseudo-gods by taking power from others. They don't remember. 
So we, they, they loved their, their creations, even though they were doing things that were putting universes in jeopardy. They knew they had to do something to help them, and they began what's called bioregenesis technologies. This is where the Melchizedek Cloister priesthood originally started. And the Melchizedek Cloister priesthood w existed long before the, t the Templar Melchizedek priesthood, which is a large part of the Melchizedek priesthood that's on the planet right now, is the Anunnaki version. They took the sacred science mechanics, some of them, and they took some of the teachings and they twisted them to, to, fill, to fulfill the Anu Elohim agenda. So there's a difference between the Melchizedek Cloister, which were the original ones from source, representing source teachings and the use of energy in the Christos manner. And then there are the others that use it, they'll use it in the Christos manner when they want to, but if it serves their agenda better, they'll run it anti-Christos. All right. When these, these, the founders committed themselves to healing this time matrix, they reinstated the Emerald Covenant again between themselves, among themselves, and among the surviving races. Anyone that wanted to enter the Emerald Covenant Peace Treaty would be welcome. There were certain protocols they had to follow. If you happen to be draconian, no, you can't keep going killing Anunnaki. If you happen to be Anunnaki, you can't keep going trying to destroy draconians. It was a, a peace treaty built on the law of one principle, which is the law of we are all faces of source. We are all together the same being. Love is the only natural, sane response to that reality. They are principles of love and community. It's called the Lyran Syrian cultural model that's built upon the law of one that teaches cooperation, not competition. It teaches the joyful things. So the Emerald Covenant was built upon those principles of freedom, love, none of this pecking order authority stuff because if you embodied your own higher consciousness of the Christos and higher, you would not act in ways that violated other life forms because you would love them, because you would feel connected to them. This was the objective of creating a whole time matrix that was based on those principles. Hey guys, welcome. So I'm just doing a little insert here again, as I said that I would do, and I'm not going to try and do too many more. But this section, I know she was talking about the law of one, and this is a big thing where I, my perspective has expanded based on what we've done recently, that we had an invasion. So I'll just show you a bit of an image. So from, from my perspective, she's referring to this sort of structure where source devolved and it split and it gets into that there was a devolution and it's a bit of an aspect of source expanding and learning the law of one so it's all one source sort of thing but there's an aspect of splitting itself and going down polarities and all that sort of stuff and there's a bit more of an expansion in this section that she had a question on and that's cool all right i'm just getting to this but what this is a visceral like a visual representation of what we've sort of understood that uh, there was an invasion from another matrices or universe that sought, sought to invade ours and take it over and it's been using us as, as nourishment and these are the phantom and wizard acts of the matrix sorry for the wind but yeah that's sort of what I'm wanting to offer to expand upon because right, I've said it many times, but this is a good release to sort of all put it together so you're pretty solid in that, all right? So I, d I just wanted to insert that clip and make sure it's pretty solid. From my perspective, it's up for you to discern, but I'll let you go back to it. Enjoy. When these, these, the founders committed themselves to healing this time matrix, they reinstated the Emerald Covenant again between themselves, among themselves, and among the surviving races. Anyone that wanted to enter the Emerald Covenant Peace Treaty would be welcome. There were certain protocols they had to follow. 
If you happen to be draconian, no, you can't keep going killing Anunnaki. If you happen to be Anunnaki, you can't keep going trying to destroy draconians. It was a, a peace treaty built on the law of one principle, which is the law of we are all faces of source. We are all together the same being. Love is the only natural, sane response to that reality. They are principles of love and community. It's called the Lyran Syrian cultural model that's built upon the law of one that teaches cooperation, not competition. It teaches the joyful things. So the Emerald Covenant was built upon those principles of freedom, love, none of this pecking order authority stuff, because if you embodied your own higher consciousness of the Christos and higher, you would not act in ways that violated other life forms because you would love them, because you would feel connected to them. This was the objective of creating a whole time matrix that was based on those principles. So they reinstated the Emerald Covenant among themselves and their races, and they began first, they had to create some form of themselves that they could incarnate into the lower dimensional frequencies to begin cleaning up the messes that were progressively being made by the warring races because they were trashing stargates all over the place. They, they took out part of Mintaka for a while, and that was repaired. And if they had kept going with the fighting, there was literally wars from like 250 billion years ago up to about uh, 570 million years ago. There was constant warring between the fallen An uh, Anuelohim forces and the Draconian forces. And they were just literally going to blow the whole place up if they didn't stop and if they didn't find healing. And they weren't going to heal if it, somebody didn't come in. So there was a group of the... Uh, founders from Density 5 that decided they would create a race that would allow them to come into the densities all the way down so they could appoint parts of themselves at each gate. They could go to Density 1 for gates 1, 2, and 3, Density 2 for gates 4, 5, and 6, Density 3 for gates 7, 8, and 9, and Density 4 for gates 10, 11, and 12. So they could put post a guard to A, repair the damage that had been done to certain of the gates, and B, protect them so those that damage didn't happen and see anymore and see offer bioregenesis healing opportunities to the fallen angelic races to hold an open invitation to any of them to re-enter the emerald covenant and in so doing they would be given the assistance they need to regenerate the natural order of their dna templates so they could embody the christos consciousness because everyone was created to be a christos being in higher so that there was a race created that literally the founders themselves incarnated through. They came from Density 5 into this race, and this race was called the Azurites. That's where Azurite Temple comes from. All right? The Azurites were a blue-skinned hominid race. They had a biology that had the 48 codes, the, the 48 D uh, strand DNA template. They, would, they were similar to what is now an indigo child type 1 that has a 48 strand DNA template but they were a little bit different in biology. They were really more geared toward the middle uh, dimensional gates rather than density one. It was hard for them to be too long in density one because the carbons in the atmosphere biologically you know, messed up their biology. They came in as they were created as something called the Azurite Universal Templar Security Team. Out of that came an uh, an organization as more races that were here decided to take um, contracts in the Emerald Covenant and to cross over into the light. There was an organization that came out of that called the Interdimensional Association of Free Worlds. And out of that came a bunch of smaller service organizations, one of which is the Guardian Alliance. All right? And that's the ones that we deal with. That's who originally first approached me in this lifetime were members of the Guardian Alliance. So there was this huge thing, and this was created long before humans were even on the scene. When humans came on the scene, there was again trouble brewing with the fallen angelics. The, dr the, the draconian ones are the ser... Yeah, all right, I'll wait till the, till the sound stops. Now, humans came on the scene as a result of continued warring between the fallen Anu Elohim and the fallen seraphim races. There were problems happening with gates 5, 6, and 7, universal stargates 5, 6, and 7. Gate 5 is the Palladian gate. Palladian Alcyon is dimension 5. This is a fifth dimensional gate, and it's in Palladian Alcyon, planet Alcyon. In density 6, it's the Cirrus B gate. I mean, D6. It's the, dens it's the density 2, D6, Cirrus B gate. In dimension 7, the seventh 
Universal Stargate is the Arcturian Gate. There was warring taking place within the races around all of those gates, and it was reaching a crisis stance again. So again, the Azurites, who were getting very tired at this point, this was a, a, literally a group of what are called Brenal Rishi. They're from Density 5, and they existed at that point, because these the groups that the founders were actually, before they t went into liquid light form, into their cat form, and into their bird forms, and into their you know reptile forms and things, they were simply balls of consciousness that look like suns. They call them Brenal Rishi, and if you saw one, it would look like a sun, literally, a solar body. They were the sons of God in a lot of the spiritual teachings, but it was S-U-Ns, not S-O-Ns. They weren't just male. But anyway, um, <laughs> uh, there was the Azurite Universal Templar Security Team that was put in here 250 billion years ago. They've been in here a long time trying to fix things. By 570 million years ago, that's a lot of spans of time. It's a lot of spans of vibration as far as time being simultaneous. That covers a large area if time was space. <laughs> they needed to create another race to come in and like a changing of the guard. Another group of what were going to be ascended masters this time. Ascended masters are consciousness that live in the primal l sound fields beyond the light fields. They're not in the time matrix originally. When a being incarnates directly from the sound fields, directly down into form, and doesn't go into incarnations in between, or it doesn't go from like a, a, a density four incarnation into a density three incarnation, it comes directly in as a new life wave. That is an ascended master, a group or an individual. There, it was decided because for all the billions of years and all the territory and time that had been covered with the Azurites trying to get th this warring stopped and trying to get these races healed, that it was still out of control. So they were going to send in a group of what are called Yanas, which is a word that means ascended master, Y-A-N-A-S. The group collectively was called the Iani, which meant group of Yanas. And they were the first Iani that were going to come in to restore and try to relieve the guard of the Azurites, work with them first, but then take over where the Azurites could ascend and leave the time matrix for a while, and the Iani would take over to, with the same Emerald Covenant, restore the Christos imprint to the time matrix mission. Now, the Iani collectives created a life form that took the best of the Azurites, but also combined it with the Elohai Elohim imprint, which is called the, the cat people imprint, was called the Anahazi. They were Lirin Anahazi. They were the white cat people. They took part of that genetic material and part of the Azurites, blue people, and put it together and created a race called the Orophim. Orophim meant sons of light. And again, not just males, <laughs> it meant sons. The Orophim would have the templates of anywhere from... Um, 36 to 48 strands, depending on what their service missions were. The Orophim were created on Terra in Density 2. They were created on Gaia, which is the Density 3 counterpart of Earth. And they were created and put on various other planets near the Stargates. From the Orophim, who were, who were created about 568 billion years ago, that form was finally solidified and you know the, the race was put in, from that race, a smaller race that didn't have to carry as much frequency that would be more geared for densities 2 and 1 instead of the higher fields, because the Orophim imprint had a hard time with density 1 especially. It had a hard time processing the carbons in, that are characteristic to density 1 atmosphere. So they downstepped their DNA from the large DNA templates to a 12-strand DNA template. That was the first what was called basic human the 12-strand angelic human. The Orphim were what are considered the gray line humans. They carried the 12, but they also carried what's called the Maji coding. The Maji coding is simply the coding that goes with the higher dimensional fields that will allow them to do planetary grid work or even galactic or universal grid work with the stargates because they can run that much frequency through their bodies without blowing their bodies up. If someone with a 12-strand template tried to run a full Kirache, They'd blow themselves up. They couldn't do it, is what it comes down to, because they would, you know, cause harm to the body. So <clears throat> it was a teamwork situation that was created by this group of ascended masters 
Ianus, Iani, that came in, created themselves, coming down the densities, as the Orophim, and then broke themselves into smaller pieces as a race called the Turinicium. Tura is a word that refers to oversoul. They were the embodied oversouls, and that's where the word Turinicium came from. That was the original name of the 12-strand angelic human. So both were, were what we call human, and they were hominid in form. The Orophim were quite beautiful. They were tall, and there were different versions of them. Some of them had more seraphic characteristics because they combined. They combined all of the genetic material in this time matrix, so they would hold the codes that could regenerate any of the codes for anything in this time matrix. They, this is where the transmissions of the Melchizedek cloister priesthoods came from, where because an Orophim would carry the codes that matched anything in the time matrix, it could restore the natural imprint by transmitting it into the template to help begin the process of DNA bioregenesis, which is reversing it back to its natural Christos template. So they came in with a mission to be the universal Templar security team, to guard the stargates and to fix them when they needed it. But they also came in with the mission to love the fallen angelics enough that they would assist in their healing and they would hold the torch, let's say, of the opportunity to enter the Emerald Covenant and to receive bioregenesis healing so eventually the fallen races could reclaim their original standing and ascend because they were trapped in this time matrix because of their own choosing. So the Orophim and the Turinicium, which are the humans, were created as a divine race, a Christos race, with a very big guardian mission, not just for the planet, but for this time matrix. Because of that, it also put the angelic humans in a very precarious position. They were immediately had an anti-force to their creation, because you had the fallen angelic legions of both draconian and Anuelohim nature that wanted them out of there. They wanted them dead because they were trying to restore the Christos template and the fallen draconian D10 collective, the Omicrons and the Dedicrons, and the Anuelohim collective of D11, they wanted to take over this time matrix. They didn't want somebody coming in and trying to fix it. So they immediately positioned themselves against angelic humans the minute we were created here. It's a very long battle we've been a part of here and in other systems. It's not new. In fact, it's so old we forgot it at this point, but it's coming back to haunt us. When humans ended up on Earth in Density 1, it was because there was invasion that took place on Terra in Density 2. Some of the humans became corrupted. They became influenced by the Anunnaki. Now, the Anunnaki were created at the same time that the Orophim were created 568 million years ago as a reaction to the creation of the Orophim. The Anu Elohim created the Anunnaki race as the Avengers of Anu. Anu is what they called their D11 collective. The Avengers of Anu had one creation purpose. They were to get rid of the angelic humans and take over. They were also to get rid of the draconians. Hey, I hope you've enjoyed this so far. I've got another clip to go. So this clip, just for a short summary, was the origin of humanity and what's gone on from her perspective uh, on an epic galactic history level to set the stage for something, all right? And so I was, when I was originally doing this, appreciating the recordings and I felt really empowered to do it today all of that was about 40 minutes and I was thinking ah, I could do it I could release like this short se segment because I'm sure you'll find that that content is freaking epic all right but I know a lot of you are hardcore and you might be sitting on the edge of your seat and wanting more and I'd rather make these releases very significant and as I said early on I'm wanting to get to the point of the Ayani massacre and do a really big release so my what I'm going to do here in this section now that was a bit that was more getting to the origin of the creation of humanity this next section does as well but it's more focused on 
a really in-depth appreciation of the Anunnaki from a big scale level. So all of this sort of content will be context for the future releases expanding on, on this because it's more focused on the larger history that went on from Earth with these variables at play before it gets into the INE massacre. So what I'll do is I'll offer you this content now and I'll see you on the other side. All right, enjoy. The Anunnaki started out in two basic forms. One was what are called the bipedial dolphin people. They look like large, blobby, fat-looking, uh, upright dolphins. Kind of, they actually look like, if you, if you took a look of a dolphin's face and made it look like it had some kind of genetic distortion where it's like a little twisted looking, they're not pretty dolphins, like, you know, dolphins can be pretty here. But they're very large. They can go from 12 to 15 feet high and they walk. They can do land or water and they are a density two race primarily, but they can come to density one. They're what are called the Jehovian Anunnaki. They're the purists. They don't like any Anunnaki that got involved with draconians and made hybrids. They are the purists that carry the agenda of wanting to wipe out all draconians and all angelic humans to take over the time matrix. There we refer to them as the Jehovian Anunnaki because they were out of a portion of what's called the Giovanni Anu Elohim matrix. That's where the word Jehovah came from. Jehovah is not the name of God. It's the name that was given to certain families that came out of the Giovanni fallen Anu Elohim collective. That's one of the trickeries that's been done here. Sure, call on Jehovah to help you. <laughs> you know, I'm sure they'll come in and they'll be glad to. You know. <laughs> So we had those type of Anunnaki, and there was another type of Anunnaki that were created, and they were aquatic apes. They were aquatic apes. They could, they, they could be underwater, or they could be on land. They were primarily land, but they could also live underwater when necessary. Now, they weren't apes that looked like the apes we have here. They were like an ape hominid. They were closer to a hominid human look than an ape is here, but they were apes nonetheless. They weren't humans. You had these two groups of Anunnaki that historically ended up fighting with each other because the aquatic apes made deals with some of the draconians and some of the reptilians, and they created a whole bunch of different hybrid Anunnaki races that carried both draconian seraphim and Anu Elohim codes. So they were, there's a whole bunch of, in, in the new material that's coming out in Voyagers 2, we get into who these people are. There's bunches of them. They're, they ended up with family names, and you hear it in like the history that has come up out of Sumeria, uh, our ancient records and things. There was the Enki family of Anunnaki. Now, all of these guys were on the aquatic ape side, right? You had the Enki family, the um, Marduk family, the Enlil family. These were not just people. They weren't single people. They were races of Anunnaki that were involved with this planet. There's also the Toth Enki Anunnaki. Toth was out of that matrix. There was also the Samjaze Anunnaki. If anybody's heard of the Billy Meyer UFO contact story with this pretty blonde lady that named Samjaze that comes out and talks to him, who calls herself a Palladian, these are the Palladian Anunnaki. <laughs> so there's Anunnaki all over the place. And there was also, um, at the time that the Anunnaki were created as the Avenger race, they began fighting with themselves. Some of them fought with the Draconians, some made deals with the Draconians, and all of them wanted to get rid of humans. So they had at least a common thing that united them. Get rid of the humans and the place is ours, right? Yeah, yeah. What about Nephilim? What are their lives? Nephilim? Nephilim were actually much later in seeding two of the humans here when the uh, certain groups of Anunnaki, the Jehovians, raided here and forced interbreeding and created a race of giants. They became, they were, became much larger than the regular humans that were here, and they tried to decimate humans, and finally the guardian groups came in and literally kicked them off the planet and stuck them on Nibiru. So they're on Nibiru right now, along with a whole bunch of other Anunnaki. Okay, anyway, back, yeah, back to history. I share this with you because I would like you to be able to at least have some understanding of the progression of events that led us to where we are now. 
So you basically have this conflict that's age old and ancient. The conflict has been there for billions of years, for millions of years once humans and Anunnaki were created. And as the Anunnaki were creating forms that could go into the lower densities to track the humans to get rid of them, the Draconians were, of course, doing the same thing. They were creating different reptilian forms, insect forms, beetle forms, combinations of reptile, insect, and beetle forms, all sorts of different strange things that are now popping up in the UFO movement quite a lot. Zetas are on that side. They're out of the fallen seraphim. The Zetas are out of a group called... <laughs> a group... <laughs> <laughs> the Zetas are out of a group called the Zephelium, and they were one of the prime seed races of one of the Draconian matrices. So you have Omicron, Odetocron, and Zephelium, and they all run a Draconian agenda, which is get control of Gate 10 and get rid of Anunnaki and get rid of humans, and then you own the place. And then the Anunnaki have their Gate 11 quest to get rid of everybody and own a place at Gate 11. <laughs> so the Zetas that, you know, that are very popular in the New Age movement right now, they're in the New Age movement and they're coming up as buddies. They're in the UFO movement coming up as negative guys. They're all out of the same group. These are fallen seraphim races that are running draconian agenda. Throughout our history here, throughout our history on Terra, before we even ended up down here, it has been a fiasco. There should, they should have done something different, is what it comes down to. When that first problem happened and the Anu Elohim blew up Stargate 12, that should have been a sign right there. <laughs> okay, put them in quarantine someplace until you can fix them, because they're going to wreak havoc on everything else in this system. There was too much leniency given. They never would have been destroyed, because the founders don't work that way. You can't destroy something. It's like trying to cut an organ out of your body. You can make the organ go away. But your body still needed that organ because it was a part of it. You need to heal it. That's the best way to fix something. They could have put them in quarantine in a different type of matrix. But they didn't because to do so would have given them a very long and hard evolutionary progression to get back to where they had been. If they could bioregenerate them in their home matrix, they would be able to evolve back into the Elohi, to the Elohi Elohim, into the, um, the seraphim, the seraphi that they were. So it was a chance to make it not, not as hard for them, even though their choices were what was making it hard. They made those choices to take an anti-Christos stance. With what has happened since that time, and the fact that literally for billions of years now, there has been this constant ongoing conflict and fight in this time matrix. That means most of the time fields that are in this time matrix are connected to this struggle in this battle. There are certain probable versions of this time matrix that that didn't happen that other choices were made, and that they were quarantined in another time matrix until their DNA problems could be worked out. That was the better solution. We're in the probability or the version of this time matrix where the other decision was made to give them a little too much rope, to give them a little too much freedom, and hope a little bit too much that they'd come back around a lot faster than they did because they still are fallen. Yes. Something's just been gnawing on me, so I gotta bring it up. Okay. It feels to me, in, in my knowing place, that though this is a, like an anti-Christos, these uh, beings that have been created this way, is it possible, though, that these energies were in some form in Source? In other words, if Source is all, and these have come out of Source to be convoluted. That's what I said. They have. But I mean, is it possible that Source itself um, doesn't necessarily hold an agenda for the Christos? In the, you know what I'm saying? That all right. Um, are, are you, you're trying, I think you're saying, are they re actually representing a part of Source that takes an anti-Christos stance? Yeah. Not really. Okay, the Christos stance is simply the formation of physics that allows for manifest universes to take place. All right. You can look at now. There is you could look at sources having both polarities within it, but not to that extreme. The source has the polarities, knowing that if you're going to have manifestation, you have to have particle and antiparticle. You have to have electrical and magnetic. But they are supposed to exist in cooperative balance with each other. The Antichristos agenda is not an expression of source's intent nor will. Source didn't create them to do this. It was an accident, and those things happen sometimes. When when creators when source creates. Source creates for the joy of it and to find out what happens. And sometimes what happens is a surprise, even to Source. 
Just like sometimes when you're making a recipe and you throw some things in, throw some extra things in, and you really surprise yourself. I had no idea that was going to happen. Sometimes these things happen. Source grows. It evolves. It's, yes. Source is evolving. Yes. In its discovery of itself in all of these forms. Right. Okay. It doesn't judge the Antichristos forms as evil, but it knows they have to be healed because it will. they will consume and bring into fragmentation more and more of Source's consciousness, and Source will be basically become fragmented within itself if they're allowed to progress. So though they are beloved, and they are a part of Source, and always will be, you can't be outside of Source, no matter how bad you are, you know, no matter how messed up you are, you're still loved and you're still part of Source. But you do need, if you're going to have access to more power and to freedom, you have to understand that you're a part of this whole thing called Source. You are one being. One being is not going to let the rest of itself rip, a, you know, one part of itself rip apart the rest of itself. That there would be no purpose other than self-destruction. So if Source had created them to be antichristic, anti to serve that role in the drama, it would basically be saying Source, Source has a death wish because it wants itself. Exactly. And that, that isn't what happened, that it was a convolution of consciousness that took place that wasn't intended. There is all sorts of a range of things Source wants to explore. When we came into manifestation and individuation, we wanted to explore all sorts of things within reason. It's the reason level that was crossed with this. When Gate 12 was blown up, that was like the utter, it, that was the original sin, by the way. The, the stories of the original sin that came down in our books, that was the original sin. And the ones who talked about it in the books were the Anunnaki. They blamed it on humans, interestingly. They're the ones, their matrix. is. When Gate 12 blew up, everything in the time matrix lost its ability to run the Maharata current, and it lost its ability to ascend. All right, so it was an anti-Christo, or, or Christos, or against the D12 pre-matter liquid light universal unified field agenda. That's what anti-Christos is. We don't use the term evil a lot, other than to point out the fact that it's, it's live spelled backwards, live or live spelled backwards. It's the reverse, running energy in the reverse, that creates the opposite of what life is. Okay. Now, with the history that started with these high places, that humans were created with a very sacred and divine commission, as sacred divine beings, as a collective of consciousness from the Ascended Master levels, it was going to come in. It was the heavy artillery. We were being sent in. Our groups were even, the original humans, the Orphim, were not just the Founders Race's consciousness from Density 5 light fields. They were from one level beyond that. They were from the primal sound fields. They were the, the big guys. They, were, they came in because it was getting so bad here that they were, it was a last ditch attempt to try to get things back into the Christos pattern before this time matrix imploded on itself. So the angelic humans that we are, because this race is angelic human lineage, we were created with the most sacred purpose. It was a purpose built on love, on knowledge, on awareness, but also on the ability to hold one's ground when necessary. If you're going to heal a bunch of people that are out of control, first you've got to get them where they stop fighting with each other, and you have to stop them from destroying you, or you're not going to help them at all. That's the role we've been in. And one of the lessons that angelic humans learned in all of this was the lessons of density and polarity. Because when you come in from the Ascendant Master's levels, there's almost a naivety that goes with it. There's huge awareness, but conflict and anything less than love seems really unreal. It's intellectually understood, but to actually go into a space, into an incarnation, and find that people can be really mean, and you love them anyway, and they really don't get it. To actually see a part of Source that you know is a part of you, because you're a part of Source, in a form that would actually be vicious to you and attack you, that was a big, rude awakening for the angelic human race when it came in. They had the one big mistake they had on their side, or against them actually, was being naive and being so immersed in the love concept and in the Christ consciousness of knowing the unity of everything. They understood intellectually completely. What they didn't know how to do was sometimes you need to protect yourself if you want to live long enough to save something or help it save itself. There were decisions made by the angelic humans that gave too much trust, too much seeing the good but refusing to see the bad, and believing that the good was so powerful that it would always win, 
Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't in the particular round of the drama. There were choices made that allowed Anunnaki to come into Tara. There were choices made that certain groups of angelic humans and orophim wanted to assist some of the Anunnaki groups with direct bioregenesis by interbreeding and creating a hybrid form that would allow the Anunnaki races to pick up the angelic human coding so for healing, but they could incarnate souls from the Anu Elohim fallen matrix in, give them a chance to evolve back into the light, which was fine. Biogenesis is okay. There were choices made. for This can be done several ways. It can be de- done through genetic engineering. It can be done through transmission of frequency, or it can be done through liter- literally um, taking two races and creating a hybrid from them. There was a hybridization program that was approved. It was Emerald Covenant approved. It was meant to help certain groups of the Anunnaki on Tara. And there were certain groups of the Orophim that got involved with it. And through the emotional bonding that took place, now Orophim and angelic humans have an ability to bond emotionally that's much different than that of an Anunnaki or a Draconian. If you can't hold the D12 Christos consciousness, bonding becomes a need exchange thing. Okay? Well, if it serves me, you know, I love it. You know, that kind of thing. <coughs> Christos love isn't like that. Christos loves regardless. Christos loves is, is being loved. You had pairings happening and families being created with Orophim humans and Anunnaki, where the Orophim were totally dedicated and totally bonded. They became very emotionally bonded, a bit too much, to the Anunnaki partners that they had. And some of them turned because they were continually worked at mentally by their spouses, by the collectives they lived within, said, look, if we did this, we could get rid of that. First, they convinced angelic humans that the Drax were the enemies and that even though High Council and the Azerites and all those guys that are the guardians and that that they're supposed to be a part of, the angelic humans are supposed to be a part of, that it was a really bad decision not to get rid of the Drax because that's why all this fighting is occurring. And some of the angelic humans bought into it. Others of them actually became enamored with the densities. Wow, physical bodies, check this out, you know, whole new game. And they got lost in it, where power and pleasure and sensation became much more important than, oh, what did I come here for? Oh, yeah, I'm on a security (laughs) team? Yeah, right, call me in the morning, you know. So there were some lessons that the ascended masters that angelic humans once were began to learn as they accepted this sacred commission. Because of the Anunnaki involvement on Terra, Terra ended up almost being exploded, or imploded, actually, 550 million years ago. And that's when this system from, that was in density 2 came down and ended up in density 1 frequencies. It was blown off the grids. And that's when the angelic humans of Terra, the ones that had survived, were commissioned because they helped to create the mess because they let the Anunnaki have too much leeway, because some of them took stands against the security councils that they had been entrusted to be part of. There was a group of Orophim and Turinissim humans that called themselves the Templar Solar Initiates. Now, originally, that was a title of honor. That was the high council that was assigned to running the planetary Templar of Terra. They were trusted by the Elohai races and the races of Cirrus B to serve as the operating fully conscious security council, a whole group of them turned and decided to use those sacred science mechanics in ways to get power and to get control of the gates and to help the Anunnaki. And that's why Terra almost was destroyed 550 million years ago. The Templar Solar Initiates, it still is actually a title of honor, but the ones who became that were very involved with the Atlantean period here later, much later, after the seedings here. But because of what they did, and because Earth and the system, all the planets in this system, in our galaxy, were part of that system originally, and they all ended up getting blown off the grids, so it was a huge repair job that had to be done. All of the planets had to be repaired. There was life seeded on various of the planets. The life that was put here and in parallel Earth were the angelic human lineage. There were a couple other groups of guardian groups that were assigned to like Venus and to Mars and to a planet called Maldak that once existed but the Anunnaki blew up. 
um, that existed, I think, where the asteroid belt is now. I think it's between uh, Jupiter and something that's out there, <laughs> Mars and Jupiter. <laughs> okay. But this is how we got here in the first place. Once we got here, it just continued. When humans were seated here, Anunnaki came, Draconians came. Our whole history from the time we were first seated has been the continuation of the wars from Terra and the wars that were the Elohim wars from before. Welcome back. I hope you gained a lot from this. It's really powerful content from my perspective and I've been sitting on it for many, many months and obviously there's been a lot in the background and I've been pushing hard on all levels, sessions and stuff and um, going through this big upgrade, sort of brewing for the next level and anchoring for whatever's to unfold in this epic planet that we're on. So I don't want to sit around for too long talking too much I want to not really pollute that perspective too much if you get my drift as I said early on this echoes part 11 origin of humanity and Inaki and our epic lost history all right I hope that makes a lot of context for you now and it expands so much and it helps to unlock a lot of stuff that may be dormant in you because I know it will, it has for me, I've listened to these over and over again and I've slept with them and they make me conk out and all that sort of stuff but so, so yeah, if you appreciate what I'm saying, I'm setting up for the Ioni Massacre and how strategic and massive that was but I also feel there's a huge, there'd been a huge gap with the context of all this stuff and nothing out there is really telling us about this solar system, Tara the higher dimensional filtering through of say the the different eras and races and skin suits to bring about the human body and then the Anunnaki's purpose right it's not really to find out there at all so I really hope this is an ally of you seeing a lot and building upon it and unlocking a lot in you that you may not have had that opportunity until you heard this content so I'm not going to keep this too long I just want to thank you for being here and allowing me to be a part of your journey I want to honor you for your courage to pursue the truth to this level and in whatever random incredible way and overcoming incredible odds for 420 billion years to just be here now and have the privilege of in this era despite how crazy it is how rich it is that we can actually find this stuff and how many of our ancestors or allies aren't here to appreciate that that you've achieved so I really hope you go and um, explore the emotional mastery part 6 and see it related to this and, and maybe this triggers a lot in you and then you go revisit that and then come back to that this and use it as a tool to expand your tech as well all right but i just want to round this out and thank you for being here and until next time guys keep pushing hard all right andre out
remember Heading for the city lights And I am seven five John Lilly once put it this way. There are no limits at all to the human mind whatsoever, except those we impose on ourselves because of our beliefs. And those limits are also beliefs to be transcended. And that's a view that suggests that the possibilities of human transformation 
are virtually infinite. And we have no way of knowing the outer horizon of what it means to be human. And really, to understand all this, everything, you have to go very, very deep in, into uh, a study of uh, history, consciousness, neurophysiology, everything. You have, to be, you have to be the supreme eclectic type of uh, leaning, and you really have to be wanting to know who you are and, and what everything is about. The thing that you'll find when you go to sacred sites, if you're very humble about it, is that you are on a personal journey and the sacred site will respond to you in a way that is appropriate only to you. The information is always what you are searching for. And it's the intent you give uh, that energy that defines whether it is used for right action or not. And it is inside these sacred spaces that you will be reminded that you are a god, that you are a bright star. So what you're trying to do is move through the course without ricocheting off walls or creating karma. You're trying to slide through things smoothly. How do you do that? It's called flowing. There is a technique that you can do that will allow you to touch some part of your inner being that has more knowledge than your conscious state does.